So hello and welcome to the afternoon of day two of the Patent Literacy Symposium. We're so excited that you're with us today um, and you're joining us for this session titled Using Structured Literacy Approaches in Intervention with Dr. Louise Spear-Swerling. We are so very excited that you joined us today. Um, my name is Lisa Coleman Bola. I'm Lisa Bola is how some, a lot of people know me, and we are ex I'm excited to facilitate this session for everybody. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, the handouts for the sessions are in the Patent Literacy Symposium on Schoology. Uh, the, the session handouts in the folder are for June 11th for this time slot. So um, you should see the time slot there. 2.3.D would be the would be the easiest way to scroll down. Um, the session, this session is a double session. So we understand that there were some people who were registered, uh, that we were capping this at 30, but it looks like we didn't get everybody in. So some of you are joining as alternates, which is fantastic news for us. We're glad to have you. Um, but if you are booked for a session in the second half, we would request that you leave now. If you're not willing to miss that session, we'd like to keep you for the entire time because um, Dr. Swirling has some breakout sessions and some um, interactive learning at the end of this that requires you being at both parts. So, um, so please keep your video, video cheat feature off and mute yourself to just eliminate any potential distractions from the presenter. The chat will be off except with me. You're more than welcome to chat with me. And if you have any questions, I can pass them on. Uh, and we, we would like, we would love for you to tweet out or share our social on social media all of your learning uh, from the Patent Literacy Symposium. Our hashtag is hashtag P-A-L-I-T Symposium 2020. Uh, we would love to have you tweet out, but thank you so much for being here. And at this point, I'm going to introduce Dr. Spear Swirling. So Louise Spear Swirling, PhD, is Professor Emerita at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. Her research interests in focus on children's reading development and literacy difficulties, as well as teacher preparation and reading. She has presented and published widely on these topics. Dr. Spear Swirling's most recent book is The Power of RTI and Reading Profiles, a blueprint for solving reading problems published by Brooks. She is also a member of several journal editorial boards, including those for the an Annals of Dyslexia, Dyslexia, Teaching Exceptional Children, and Reading Psychology. In 2009, she served on the working group for the International Dyslexia Association that produced a national IDA professional standards for teachers of reading. Dr. Spear Swirling prepared both general and special educators to teach reading using structured literacy approaches for many years. Currently, she consults regularly for Connecticut school districts, mostly on cases involving students with severe or persistent literacy difficulties, including dyslexia. She is also centrally involved in writing a major revision of state guidelines on identification of children with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, thank you so much to the people who are here um, who have an interest in the topic. Um, and I think that um, Lisa covered pretty much all of the uh, important housekeeping details. I just wanted to give you a heads up that um, I will allow some time, a, a brief Q&A break. It's not really going to be in the middle. It's going to be a little past the middle um, for people to ask questions. Um, I'm not, I, I'm, I, normally I would just plan a break for people to get up and stretch their legs, but since we're doing this virtually, I'm assuming you can do that anyway. So, um, so that is up to you but we will do a short break, um, maybe five minutes for questions about two thirds of the way through the talk. So if you have questions um, you'd really like answered, please make a note of those. And also if I don't get to your question today, uh, at the very end of my slides, there will be a slide with my email and please feel free to contact me if you have other questions you would like to ask. So um, this afternoon session, I'm talking about using structured literacy approaches in intervention. And um, I would like to begin by talking about my uncle, who's shown here in this picture, which was probably taken around 1945, shortly after my uncle returned from serving in World War II. The woman in the picture uh, with him is my mother, to whom he would close. And the thing about my uncle that is relevant for today's talk is that he never learned to read. 
And when I was a child, I was told, you know, don't ever ask him to read to you because he cannot read. So this was obviously a source of embarrassment and difficulty for him. In some ways, I think, um, it, in some ways, things were a bit easier than they would be now in the sense that uh, my uncle was never at a loss for making a living. He worked in the textile mills. He worked in construction. Um, I think I remember that he built their, their home or built a, a room on their home. He supported a wife and five children, which is not something I would be able to do. So um, he really, uh, he did well by, you know, by comparison with, I think, a person in, in modern life who could not read would have probably more difficulty with uh, job attainment and economic security and things like that. But nonetheless, this was a source, I'm sure, of great difficulty for him and, and embarrassment. And looking back, I'm sure my uncle was dyslexic, um, somebody who you know, never learned to read at all despite having instruction and somebody who was clearly of normal intelligence and um, very capable of learning. And if he, if it were now, um, he would have, I think, much more chance of success in reading. And particularly if methods such as structured literacy were used with him. Um, but unfortunately, that was not known in the 1940s, or at least to the extent it was known, it was not being used very much in schools. Um, so, so I always think of people like my uncle um, that didn't get to have the benefit of, you know, what we now know about how to teach students effectively, which will be the main to uh, topic of the talk. So um, the instruction most effective for at-risk students and those with serious reading problems, including dyslexia, has been termed structured literacy by the International Dyslexia Association. And the content of structured literacy, it's, I think it's helpful to think of these programs and approaches. They're not contrary to what is a popular, uh, a, what I think is a common misunderstanding. It's not about just one commercial program or just one approach. There is a number of commercial programs and approaches that fall under the umbrella of structured literacy, but they all share certain features. So one feature is that the content is focused on language skills, which we know are really important in reading. We know that from research. So one important language skill that would be addressed in structured literacy approaches is phonemic awareness awareness of and the ability to manipulate sounds in spoken words, um, phoneme graphing relationships, which are sounds for letters and letter patterns, orthography, which refers to larger spelling patterns and rules. So for example, there are some words that sound like they start with sp, but you know that that's going to be an S P, not an S B, even though the second sound sounds a little bit like a B. Do you think about it? Because we don't have S B in English as a blend. S B is not a blend. So um, kids kind of pick that up. Many children pick that up just from you know their experience in reading. Morphology has to do with meaningful word parts, so roots, prefixes, suffixes. Syntax involves sentence structure, and um, semantics involves meaning at the word, sentence, and discourse level. So structured literacy uh, approaches address all of these areas, not, not only phonics, even though that's how they're often thought of. Um, some of the principles and methods of structured literacy include explicit teaching of important concepts and skills. Children are not expected to infer important concepts and skills simply from exposure. Um, structured literacy programs use systematic teaching that follows a planned scope and sequence from easier to more difficult skills and concepts. So you start out with simpler skills and build toward harder ones. 
um, there's a lot of attention in structured literacy to prerequisite skills. So an example would be if um, children would learn sounds for common letter patterns, such as SH, TH, Q, U, A, L, L, before they are expected to read them in words. Um, sometimes this type of instruction is thought of as being, you know, boring, drill and kill. It's sometimes been mischaracterized that way, but it's important to emphasize that um, you can use hands-on, engaging, and multimodal instruction, like using letter tiles to build patterned words or counters and blocks in phonemic awareness activities. And um, you can see in the picture the Wilson letter tiles, but many programs have you know, similar types of, um, of materials that they use. And it is important to use these materials because if children are not engaged in the instruction, then no matter how good the instruction is, you're not going to be able to teach them effectively. So how do typical non-SL literacy practices, how children are often taught to read, how does that differ from what you would do in structured literacy? And there's sort of a principle in structured literacy that um, when you're teaching a skill, it's valuable to use non-examples of the skill as well as examples. So in a sense, what I'm doing here is trying to enact that principle to show you what is not structured literacy as well as what is structured literacy. So phonics instruction in non-structured literacy approaches, um, usually phonics is included on many, you know, I've had many people, district people say to me, well, we teach phonics. And um, it is true, pretty much everybody does teach phonics now, but it's often not emphasized even for beginners. So one very popular reading program teaches phonics as one of only eight areas, um, as only one of eight areas, even in grade one. So here's an area that is really foundational to everything else that, that children have to learn in reading. And it's only one of eight things at a first grade level. So not getting a lot of emphasis Often this phonics teaching is not very explicit or systematic. Um, so for example, children may be expected to read difficult multisyllabic words such as author or illustrator when they cannot yet decode much simpler words such as book. Or children may be expected to spell words with common suffixes like flipped and barking when they have not yet learned to spell the base word flip and bark. Um, another uh, characteristic in non-SL practices is sometimes there's an emphasis on word walls in which word patterns and word regularity vary greatly. So it's very difficult for children to infer phonics relationships. So here's an example of a grade one word wall for the letter B that I pulled from the web. And you can see it's all common words like B, then, best, big, etc. So let's think about the pattern. B is an open syllable with a long vowel. Ben is usually taught as irregular, except some of the Canadians say B, so maybe it's not irregular there. Um, best is a closed syllable with a blend. Um, big is another um, closed syllable, closed single consonant, so it, it could be we're kind of onto a pattern here, except that with boy, we now have a vowel team not a short vowel word, which is what children would be learning, especially early in grade one. Brother is irregular, and bird has only one vowel, so it might look like it should have a short vowel, but it's not, it's a vowel of. So you can see from the examples that children, if they didn't have a strong phonics core in the program and they were and the program is kind of relying heavily on word walls, be, it would be very difficult for a student, especially a struggling student, to infer phonics relationships. A child might infer that, um, you know, it's sort of useless to try to figure it out, which is not what we would want them to do. Um, in non-SL practices, initial phonics instruction may heavily emphasize a larger unit approach, such as word families. 
So my children are all grown up, grown up now, but I remember when they were learning to read, they would come home with these rings of words and the words would have word families like back, pack, track, shack, and so on. And they were supposed to learn the words. But since phonics um, skills for letter sounds or letter patterns were not really being taught explicitly and the words were so similar, what they would do is just figure out the pattern, and then they wouldn't look at the rest of the words. They would know, oh, these are all act words. And so then they would just look at the first letter. So this kind of approach doesn't foster close attention to letter sequences in words, which is a key habit for beginning readers to develop. Also, if you're focusing on whole words or even on second rhyme, it's difficult to see how the teacher incorporates phoneme blending, which we know is an important skill for children to learn. Um, what does research say about the type of phonics instruction that should be provided? We know that phonics instruction is important, but there's often less attention paid to exactly what type of approach is beneficial. Well, certainly um, there's wide agreement among researchers that phonics should be taught explicitly and systematically. So explicit means the teacher models and clearly explains how to decode words, how to spell words. Systematic means there is a logical progression of skills with prerequisite skills taught before more advanced skills. So you would teach simpler word types like consonant, vowel, consonant words before more complex word types, such as short vowel words with consonant clusters, which also make more demands on blending. Um, the NRP, the National Reading Panel, at the time they did their report, they were not really able to distinguish among different phonics programs in terms of effectiveness, or I should say different phonics approaches. So they weren't able to say, you know, uh, whole word approaches like word families are better or worse than approaches in which you teach letter sounds and blending. However, the NRP report came out in 2000, and there's been a lot of reading research since then. And as um, Susan Grady and others have argued, post-NRP research favors initial phoneme level approaches in which children learn letter sounds and blending over initial use of larger unit approaches like word families, analogy phonics, or onset and rhyme. So here's an example of a phoneme level approach to decoding. If we wanted a child to decode shack, we would have them learn the sounds for the letter patterns SH, A, and CK, and how to blend them. So the child learns SH, A, K, and how to blend it. And, it, and then it's easy to include phoneme blending and phoneme segmentation in this kind of approach because as children are, say, building words with letter tiles or spelling words, they're doing the phoneme blending and segmentation right in the context of that type of activity. Um, it's important to say that phoneme level approach does not mean that children are decoding all words letter by letter. That doesn't work very well in English. So if we were decoding shack letter by letter, we would come up with something like not the word, right? So children always in English, or maybe not always, but certainly from very early on, they have to learn letter patterns. But the point is the instruction is at the level of phoneme. So sh is a phoneme, as represented by ck is a phoneme. And then children are learn how, learning how to blend those. Now, eventually children do have to learn larger units. So common vowel patterns, vowel with r, and common morphemes like um, the common suffixes like ing and ed. So those are have to be taught as well. Um, but those would be usually taught slightly later, not right at the very beginning. Um, another problem with non-structured literacy approaches involves certain instructional activities that may unintentionally confuse or mislead children about how to read unknown words. 
And um, one of the best examples of this problem involves the use of word configuration activities or word shapes, reliance on word shapes. So in a word configuration activity, children would be given words like the words shown at the top, and they're supposed to, you know, write the word rat in the middle set of boxes because it's two short letters and a tall letter, and eight goes in the far right boxes and four goes in the uh, far left boxes. Um, this is completely useless for learning how to decode or spell unknown words. Word shape is just not informative for reading words in English. It's informative when children are learning maybe a very small number of words that vary in shape, but very quickly it becomes an irrelevant cue. So it's kind of like drawing children's attention to the wrong thing. So um, if you're not convinced, Think about, for example, the word rat. If you're, um, if you're focusing on the shape, rat could be cub, or it could be mob, or it could be wed, or it could be eat, or it could be art, or like a million other words. So just not useful um, to highlight. And I have sometimes had uh, my son, who's a special ed teacher, his school was using this sort of approach. And I was like, oh, buddy, you, you know, like you cannot do this. This is horrible. And um, he, the, it, and he, you know, agreed because he's, I have been, you know, indoctrinated well in phonics. But um, he pointed out, you know, that teachers needed something for children to do as seek work while teachers were working with small groups. And that's a legitimate need. But the point is there's lots of really useful phonics-based types of activities that children can do more independently um, than, than having them do something like this. So in structured literacy, how would a word like art be taught? Um, this is a vowel R word because you have an A immediately followed by an R, a, a vowel followed by an R. Children learn that the letter pattern AR says R. Children blend art to produce art. And this approach would help children decode many other words with similar patterns and letter sounds. For example, art, arc, arm, bark, lark, smart, start, hard, farm, tar, and so on. You can see where this is more useful than word families, um, because if children are learning, you know, a, a word family like arc words, it helps them with arc, bark, lark, but it doesn't help them with the other kinds of words. A phoneme level approach, you can vary the words in ways that if the child knows the letter sounds and the patterns and can blend, then there's lots of words that they are able to decode. And you're also forcing attention to all the letters in a word, which is very adaptive for you know, learning how to read in an alphabet like English. And then repeated exposure to words with similar letter patterns builds automaticity. Um, now, English has, certainly has irregular words, exception words. So what about those? Those um, word shape activities are just as inadequate for irregular as for regular words. So let's consider a word like was as a sample irregular word. Um, how would you teach was in a structured literacy approach? Well, um, multisensory whole word tracing techniques can be very helpful for these kinds of words. So for example, the child is given the word written on a piece of paper and they trace the word repeatedly. While they're tracing, children say the letter names and then the whole word. So something like W-A-S was, W-A-S was. Um, because you don't want them thinking, you know, what at the same time they're, they're tracing the word. That would, again, be like negative learning. The activity draws the child's attention to the sequence of letters in the word. So that, I think that's one of the things that can be very helpful about the multisensory activities. After repeated tracing and saying, the children try to write the word from memory. And then if they make a mistake, you repeat the tracing and saying process and learned words go into some kind of file or a repository for ongoing review because we know they're not gonna remember it just from one time. Um, and it's also useful to point out the specific irregularity in the word because recent re reading research 
has um, highlighted the idea that many irregular words are mostly regular, except for one part of the word, which is often the vowel. So in um, done, for example, it's the O that's irregular. Otherwise, it would be regular. And same thing with some and come. Pretty, it's the E that's irregular. So it can be helpful to point that out to children because you can tell them that what they know about phonics is still somewhat helpful for these words, but there is an irregularity in the word. Um, word shape is also irrelevant for spelling. Um, in, an, in a in structured literacy approach, you would teach language-related knowledge to help children spell words correctly. And this includes not just phoneme graphing knowledge, but also orthographic knowledge, morphology, and semantic knowledge. So let's consider a word like scratch, how you would teach scratch in a structured literacy approach. There's a helpful spelling generalization for words with TCH. You use TCH to spell ch when the ch comes immediately after a short vowel sound at the end of a one syllable word, like scratch, batch, itch, sketch, dutch, hutch, and so on. There are some exceptions to this generalization, but it's much more useful than trying to use word shape or rote memorization of words. And um, it should be pointed out, other words require other types of language knowledge. So, for example, knowledge about how to common, how to spell common roots and affixes. Um, for, for example, in a long word like psychology, if the child knows how to spell the root, that's really helpful. It sounds like it should be, you know, S-I-K something, um, but it's, it's not because the word is of Greek origin. Um, also, sometimes um, you have to teach them about meaning to enable spelling of certain words. So, uh, for example, to T-O versus T-W-O versus T-O-O, -O, children have to know, well, if it's the number, it's T-W-O. If it's the one that means also, it's T-O-O, -O, and so on. Um, here's one that's really um, problematic for uh, children who struggle in reading. In non-SL practices, instruction often relies on multiple cueing systems models of reading. So um, a little bit about this model, which is sometimes called MSB. This is based on the work of Goodman, Clay, and others, and it says that children become good readers by using multiple cues to read words. And I've highlighted to read words because that's an important distinction that I'll explain further in a minute. So the three um, cueing systems are visual or graphophonic cues, like letter sounds, semantic cues uh, referring to meaning, and syntactic cues referring to sentence structure. And in this approach, in the MSB approach, if children come to a word they can't read, they're encouraged to use the letter cues, but also in conjunction with pictures and sentence context, rather than looking first at the word um, to decode it. Um, Emily Hanford, I don't know, probably a lot of you know Hanford's work. If you don't, I urge you to look up her report at, at a loss for words, and she has many other reports as well that are very helpful. I've shown the link here. Um, Emily is a journalist, not a reading researcher, but her work is very based in um, reading research, and she explains the problems with MSV and the implications um, better probably than anybody I've ever seen. She has really good um, and uh, clear explanations for a general audience. And um, so she has these graphics come from Emily's article and show, um, you know, examples of MSV strategies that come from the web, like Eagle Eye, Use the Picture, or Skippy Frog, Skip to the End, and Hop Back, and um, get your mouth ready for the worst first sound, which I'm not even really sure what that means. Um, so decades of scientific evidence shows that the multiple cueing systems model is wrong. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating about the decades. We have known since the 1980s that it's the poor readers, not the good readers, who rely heavily on context. 
poor readers or beginners. Um, you know, be very beginning readers can't read that many words. So yes, they rely on context. But what characterizes good readers is they rapidly develop um, accurate automatic decoding and so they don't need context anymore. So teaching children to rely on context is kind of like teaching them to be poor readers when you could teach them to be good readers. Um, a friend of mine who used to be a paraprofessional told a story about um, the teacher in her class. This was really in the heyday of whole language and so the kids were learning all this MSV stuff and um, the teacher pointed out the best reader in the class to the children and praised her by saying, Maisie is such a good reader. She knows all of her strategies, meaning the kinds of things that were on the previous slide, you know, looking at the picture, et cetera. And the child piped up and said, I do know them, but I don't use them. When I see a word I don't know, I just sound it out, which is, what, which is why Maisie was a good reader. So why does this matter? Because as Emily Hanford discusses, when she talked to teachers about this issue, a lot of teachers said, um, well, you know, it's good for children to use more than one cue. And, and why is it a bad thing to use other information? Um, here's, here are some things that are problematic about this approach. Encouragement to guess at words in decoding distracts children, especially beginners, from close attention to the print. And close attention to the print is very problematic for, develop, for developing skilled, fluent reading. In English, lots of words differ in just one letter. And it makes a huge, you know, the one letter makes a huge difference. So children have to get into the habit of looking really closely at letters and words. Also, guessing based on context doesn't work well for advanced text. If you're reading, you know, a very simple book, first grade level book, it might work pretty well. But once children are in, you know, third or fourth or fifth grade and they have to read about, you know, the culture of Denmark or something like that, it's not going to work too well. Um, even, and I've seen this all the time in doing consultations, even if phonics is being taught well in one part of the reading curriculum, if children learn to get the words when they read text, this will tend to undermine their reading process, uh, progress because they're not reading accurately in passages and you have to have accurate reading before you can have fluent reading. Um, also, guessing at words based on context can be a really hard habit to break. And it's especially problematic for children with dyslexia and other decoding difficulties because these children are already inclined to over rely on context because they have problems with decoding but verbal strengths. So it's easier for them to guess than it is to sound words out. A really important distinction here, and this is why I underlined that phrase before about reading words, it's important to distinguish using context to read words versus to aid comprehension. So consider a, a short passage like, Mary has two cats. When they go to sleep, they like to snuggle up to each other. So let's say a child cannot read the word snuggle. She uses the first couple of letters combined with the picture and or sentence context to try to read the word. This is using context to aid decoding. Let's consider a second scenario. So let's say another child can read the text, including the word snuggle, but does not know what the word snuggle means. She uses sentence context and or the picture to figure out that the word means move into a warm, comfortable position. This is using context to aid comprehension. The first one is problematic. The second one is not. So good readers do not rely heavily on context to aid decoding, but they do use context to aid comprehension, for example, to figure out unfamiliar word meanings or multiple meanings of words. So as a teacher, the first one, you want to be really um, careful and not to kind of encourage, you know, guessing at words. But the second one, for children to use context to figure out what a word means or multiple meanings of words, things like that, um, it's, that's a good thing to encourage children to do. 
Um, a related problem in non-structured literacy practices involves the types of texts that are used for children's reading, especially in the early stages of learning to read. So early on in non-SL approaches, children are often placed for text reading in predictable level texts. These texts usually contain many words that weak decoders are unable to decode. This does not give weak decoders opportunities to apply their decoding skills in text reading. And it also tends to foster a habit of guessing at words based on pictures or sentence context. So here's an example of a predictable text from um, the Reading A to Z website. Um, and this, this site also has some very good decodables, but um, this is not what I'm showing you here. These are the leveled readers. So um, in the Maria story, the text says, I get my backpack, showing Maria reaching for her backpack. I get my pencils, showing Maria with her pencils. I get my ruler, showing Maria with her ruler. I get my eraser, shows Maria with her eraser. So what is the child, especially the child who doesn't read words well, going to learn to do from this? Well, the text is explicitly structured to encourage looking at the picture and guessing based on the word, rather than looking carefully at the word. Because the beginning, you know, first grader, which is the grade level of this text, is not going to be able to actually read words like eraser. Oh, here's one more. Okay, same problem. Okay, in a structured literacy approach, beginning decoders, and this could be a beginning first grader, or it could be an older student, but one who's functioning at a very low reading level. These children would read texts that provide a good match to the decoding skills they have learned and that do not encourage guessing at words. Sometimes these texts are called phonetically controlled. That's how I'm using the word decodable. So I'm using it to mean the type of text where you control the word patterns so that it can be matched with whatever you know, um, skills, phonic skills a child has. So here's an example of a decodable series that I used to use with my um, students when they were, when I was um, supervising a tutoring program that we ran in public schools. And this is a, a early grade one text about the same level as the Maria text. Um, and it's from the right skills series, uh, decodable series. Again, this publisher has a variety of types of books. So it's the decodable series that I'm talking about. And you can see that this text is structured very differently from the predictable text. So there's a very nice picture. My daughter would have loved this when she was little because she loved foxes. Um, but you can't really use the picture to guess at the words. The picture, you know, it's just not that informative for guessing specific words. And the words, notice, are controlled to basically CBC words uh, with all vowels. So fox, dug, den, cub, mom, red. There's a few words that are sight words like um, like, um, you know, you. But there's always going to be some words like that in any text because it's basically impossible to write a sentence in English without using some um, phonetically irregular types of words. Um, poor decoders at more advanced levels of decoding usually don't require decodable um, in the sense of phonetically controlled types of text. So um, if you have, say, a ninth grader who's reading at a fifth grade level, well, that student is far behind in reading. And assuming that part of their reading problem involves decoding, decoding should still be addressed. But at a fifth grade level, the student can decode a wide enough range of words that you probably don't want to place them in highly controlled materials. It's not needed, but you would need to place them at, you know, a fifth grade level or whatever their instructional level is. And they should be able to decode with a high degree of accuracy. If you were in the morning session, we talked about this a little bit, that um, the 90 or 92 percent word accuracy figure for instructional level that teachers often learn, and that's what I learned, um, is really more pertinent to a grade one level. 
And as children get older, they really need a much higher level of accuracy to support good comprehension. So um, if you're, you know, if we were talking about like a seventh or eighth or ninth grade student, we would, good readers at that level would decode with probably 97, 98, 99, or 100% accuracy. Um, Non-SL practices often fail to provide explicit systematic teaching of higher level aspects of language such as syntax, which are also taught in structured literacy approaches. It's often the phonics and phonemic awareness aspect of structured literacy that gets attention, but these approaches do provide uh, explicit teaching of higher levels also of um, literacy. So um, Charlie Haynes does great work in written expression, Charlie Haynes and his colleagues. And um, so I think their approach is a great example, but certainly not the only one of structured literacy teaching for written expression. Um, so one of the things that they do is they address key component language abilities of writing such as phonology, which affects spelling, vocabulary knowledge, syntax, discourse structure, um, and they would use unstructured hands-on activities at the word, sentence, and then micro discourse, which is two or three related sentences, and then discourse level paragraph or longer. So it's very systematic and step-by-step. Um, as opposed to, you know, expecting a student to write a long passage when you have a student that can barely spell or barely write a, a good sentence. Um, one of the things I love about their approach is they explicitly teach certain very useful but rarely taught skills, such as different ways to state the same idea uh, or the same sentence. I'll give you an example of that um, in a few slides. And um, their approach illustrates very direct, systematic instruction, building from simple to complex. The teacher uses scaffolding, such as graphic organizers and visual cues, but these would be faded gradually over time as a student has less need for them. Um, some non-SL instructional approaches make explicit systematic teaching extremely difficult. Sometimes it's just sort of built into the um, organization and, and that's not always, you know, recognized, but it really makes it impossible for the teacher. So I think um, a good example of this is Reader's Workshop. So Reader's Workshop does include some things that can certainly benefit children. It's got some explicit instruction via mini lessons, it includes some activities from which children can certainly benefit, like working on language and partner work. Um, but there's also a heavy emphasis on children working independently and in different self-selected texts. And to be fair, you know, in a good implementation of Reader's Workshop, the teacher would be providing a lot of guidance to the children in selecting texts, and the teacher confers with students individually on reading and writing. So, I don't know, a lot of this sounds pretty good. Why is it a problem? Well, there's limited time for explicit teaching. And the model really does not lend itself to systematic teaching. So if you're going to teach systematically, you have to have a sequence of skills that you're addressing. And you can't really do that when every student is kind of in a different book. You know, it, 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 I would think about this this way. We need something in between Every student is doing exactly the same thing in lockstep, which is obviously not a good thing, but also individualizing to the point where every student is doing so many different things that you can't really teach groups of kids in a systematic way. Um, there's also not enough focus practice for reading uh, for the weaker readers in a class. Um, even when the teacher provides guidance, children will not necessarily choose optimal texts for their own learning. And if every child is reading a different book, it could be very challenging for the teacher to give more than superficial input during conferences or consistently recognize students' misunderstandings of a text. If a, if a teacher has to be familiar with, you know, 20 or 25 different books that are being read. 
also in this model and, and in some others as well, a substantial amounts of classroom time are often devoted to silent independent reading. And this is not a great use of classroom instructional time, especially for the weaker readers in a class. Now here's another important distinction that I want to highlight. The distinction between encouraging free time independent pleasure reading, which is a really good thing for teachers to do, versus devoting substantial amounts of classroom instructional time to silent independent reading. So we know that children can derive many benefits from independent pleasure reading. For example, it can help them build fluency, vocabulary knowledge, background knowledge. Um, a study that I did years ago showed that it had impacts on spelling, children who did a lot of reading, presumably because they saw more words in print, um, developed a better sense of you know, spelling than other children. So we, we certainly want to encourage children to read and read for enjoyment. And some ways that teachers can do this is um, make a wide range of books available to children, have books at different levels so that um, children who are weaker readers or stronger readers can find books appropriate to them. Um, assign and guide independent reading as homework. So um, one of my children had a really great teacher, one of the best teachers either of them ever had years ago. And she did had a lot of independent reading as homework, but you know, she had certain guidelines that kids had to follow. So they couldn't read, you know, um, my daughter's big uh, love back then, then was the Animorphs series. I don't know if kids still read it, but it was, um, basically about the characters were able to turn into animals, which is, you know, was right up my daughter's alley. But her teacher would not let her read 50 Animorphs books in a row. She provided some guidelines. Kids sometimes had to pick a biography or they had to pick an adventure book or, you know, and they had a wide choice of books within that, but it kind of made them try out different things and that would also facilitate learning better. Um, certainly independent reading as a free time classroom activity is something that could uh, be beneficial once children have finished, you know, seat work or some project that they're working on and developing book groups, especially for older children, can be um, beneficial. However, that's all about reading outside of school or for free, you know, free time when uh, the teacher is not teaching. But classroom instructional time for literacy is limited. And poor readers often need substantial amounts of explicit systematic teaching to progress. Many poor decoders, if a child's problem is in decoding, um, they're not necessarily ready to read, to do a lot of, um, you know, a long stretch of silent reading. Um, many times I've been asked to observe kids where the teacher is doing a long independent reading block in class and, you know, my little guy is on the same page for 20 minutes and obviously not reading anything because probably because the book is too difficult for them, but also many of these students don't you know, the ones I see don't even have an independent level yet, not really. They need to decode better to get to a level where they can read something that is um, of interest to them. So prioritizing a substantial block of instructional time to independent reading is not a good use of time, especially for these students, that is the weaker readers in the class. Um, why, why is structured literacy especially important for at-risk or poor readers? These approaches directly target the core problem in poor reading, which is various components of language. Is, if you were in the morning session, we talked about that, about different components of language in which children can be weak. So all of those are you know, addressed in structured literacy. Um, also, an important quality is that structured literacy provides explicit systematic teaching that is efficient as well as effective. Um, of course, we all want instructional methods that are effective, but if something takes a lot, if, if you know, approach A takes a lot longer than approach B, well, efficiency matters too, because um, often 
the children who are poor readers are behind and their progress needs to be accelerated. Um, some children, of course, learn to read well with non-structured literacy practices. But these kinds of practices are an especially bad fit for at risk or poor readers and structured literacy approaches are a much better fit for these students. And again, they include structured literacy is kind of an umbrella term that includes a variety of, of, of um, commercial programs and approaches. If certain features of structured literacy were incorporated into tier one instruction, that could benefit many students, not only those identified with reading problems. So for example, adequate emphasis on phonemic awareness and phonics in the early grades with flexibility, if you have kids who come into the classroom already knowing how to decode, they get accelerated to something else. But um, if you build in the feature so that it's the default, that would be really helpful for, um, for a lot of kids. Because sometimes early on, you don't know which kids are going to be at risk. And so um, in some ways, this would be prevented for certain kids. So um, I'm going to pause now for sort of a brief Q&A if people have questions, maybe about five minutes or so. At this point, they don't. Okay. Um, there's no questions. Again, that's one of those things that that it's always very clear, so it's easy to follow. Um, but I'm not sure if people want to offer anything to the chat at this point. Oh, she. So I did get one from Mary uh, that said, "Can you mention the Hayes program again?" Oh, um, it's Charlie Hayes. So it's H A Y N E S. And um, he's at Mass General in uh, Boston. And um, he also did, if you know the IDA publication, Perspectives, he, um, there was a special issue on structured literacy um, probably you know, six months ago. And Charlie did an article for that. So if you check the IDA website, particularly if you're an IDA member, um, you should be able to access the article for free. I don't know. I don't know about other people, but you know, you could try um, contacting Charlie directly and seeing if you could get a copy or just looking it up on the web. But his article in that perspective issue um, uh, provides a great kind of overview of the approach that he and his colleagues take. Uh, she just replied, thank you. Yep. That's it. I think we're good for now. Okay, great. All right. So then I will um, forge on. So, um, so I wanted to, I structured the talk so that um, I provided, um, I gave the, the beginning part of contrasting structured literacy with non-structured literacy approaches. And in the next segment, um, before we do the, the breakout groups, I'm going to provide more detail about um, uh, additional activities that could be used in structured literacy approaches. And these are all, these are intended to be samples. So the intent is not to say it, it has to be done this way, but they're good examples of the types of activities you would see in structured literacy. So in structured literacy approaches, syllable types are often taught. And if you know, you know programs like Wilson or, or in Gillingham, um, syllable types are a prominent feature. They're not in all uh, structured literacy programs, but they're in many of them. And um, here's the problem, here's the issue that syllable types help to address. So vowel sounds are highly variable in English. Um, for example, uh, like if you know a, another language such as Spanish, the letter A in Spanish is pretty much always A, right? Like in taco or tamale or abuela. But um, in English, not so. So in English, a, the letter A can say A like in cat, A like in cake, A like in lawn, um, A, so the sounds you hear in arm, the A, uh, the schwa sounds like in go and so on. So syllable types sort of help children figure out, this is a particularly challenging aspect of learning to decode in English for beginners. 
So syllable types can be useful in determining the vowel sound of a syllable. And um, in SL approaches that teach them, usually six basic syllable types are taught, closed, silent E, open, vowel R, vowel T, and consonant LE. And you would teach, you don't do all six at once. You know, you do, you do them gradually over time. Um, and word sorting activities are extremely helpful for the children to learn about syllable types. So, um, so here's the uh, activity that I'm going to give you shows uh, an example of an activity for children at the stage where they have learned uh, like close and magic -y syllable types. So they're kind of toward the beginning. So the teacher should begin with a, a concise explanation, which could be a review of whatever the syllable type is, including examples and non-examples of the syllable type. So for example, if you're teaching or reviewing the closed syllable rule, you would say a, something like this. A closed syllable has just one vowel and it ends in a consonant. Um, and then if it's review, you maybe don't need the examples and the non-examples, but if you were giving those, you know, an example would be a word like that, or it could also be a longer word like crunch, and a non-example would be a word like boat, because it has um, two vowels in it, or a word like um, she, which has only one vowel, but it doesn't end in a consonant. You use index cards with sample words for the different syllable types that children have learned to this point. And then the child sorts the words by syllable type and gives the correct vowel sound for each word, and then they read the word. Um, a really important thing for me to stress here is that you want the focus to be on having children recognize the patterns give the vowel sound and read the words, not verbalization of the rule. I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on verbalizing the rule because it, it, it sucks up time and that sometimes children will get confused when they verbalize it. If they can recognize the pattern in the printed word and the vowel sound, that's what matters. So the teacher has to be able to verbalize it in a clear, concise way. But the children don't necessarily have to perfectly verbalize the rule. What they have to be able to do is recognize the patterns consistently. Careful choice of sample words is very important. This is a key feature of structured literacy, is that like the examples that you choose. Are, um, are thoughtful and important. So um, if I were doing a, an activity for children at this stage, I might have, you know, three headings, like sh as shown in blue, closed, silent E, and the neither category, which I'll explain in a minute. And then you would have words on index cards. So munch, sit, flat, and so on. All of these words in all three columns would be on index cards, and they would be all mixed up. And then the task for the child would be to, to sort them as closed, silent E, or neither. And then um, for the closed and silent E, they go through and they give the vowel sound and then they can read the, they read the word if they can. Um, if you have a child who's, um, who can't handle, say, blends yet, can't handle a word like stretch, they could skip that one in terms of the reading. But they could still give the vowel sound. Um, and then that will prepare them when they are encountering that word in the future once their blending abilities have improved. Um, here's the reason I have a neither category. And this is really just what I was trained to do as a teacher. I had, <coughs> I was extremely fortunate to have great teacher preparation. And this was like in the late 1970s. So, um, you know, I was just really, really lucky. Um, but this is how I was trained to do it, and it, what I found was that it works well. So the reason you want a neither category is you don't want the children looking just at the last letter. If you don't have a neither category, then for silent E, they're just going to look for the final E. But really, they have to look at the whole pattern in the word. So dance, for example, is not a silent E, even though it ends in an E. Same thing for free. It's not a silent E. 
So, but you don't have to give them a lot of verbiage about how, you know, dance is not a song of meaning, it's free. You don't have to do the verbiage if you pick the examples well, and then you're kind of teaching through the examples. And if a child makes a mistake in sorting, so let's say they sort dance or free as a silent E word, then you would say, um, you would give feedback something like this. Okay, let's look at this word. Does it have a pattern of one vowel, one consonant, and an E to end the word, which is the relevant pattern for silent E? Um, and if the child still says yes, have them mark the vowels and the consonants in the word so they can see that the pattern, the word does not fit that pattern. Um, word building activities for decoding and spelling, especially for children who are at early stages of decoding and spelling, extremely helpful activity. So for this activity, you use letter tiles with letters and letter patterns representing um, phonemes. Again, it's at the phoneme level. So um, SH, CK, CH, those would each be on one tile because even though it's two letters, it's one sound, right? So it's one tile for those letters. You use only letters and letter patterns that children have been taught. Um, you form a sequence of words with random phoneme changes. It shouldn't always be the first letter or the first phoneme in a word. That's the, you know, word family's problem. And um, of course, you have to filter out phonetically irregular words. Um, and then for spelling, the teacher would be dictating the words and the child uses the letter tiles to spell them. Try to achieve a brisk pace. I used to use have my students use this activity in their tutoring, um, and it's a game-like activity that's very engaging for many children if it's a, if it's done well. Um, I have looked online to try to find good models of this to show my students when they're first learning, and I have to tell you the biggest problem I have is that usually it's done too slow. So you want it to be, you know, obviously you don't want to go so fast that the child is making lots of mistakes, but you try to kind of push it to a point where you have a brisk pace and it's like a game. And um, if you do it that way and you, and you have, you know, um, if you're using content where the kids can be successful, it's, um, it's very engaging for a lot of kids. And it can also be done as a paper and pencil activity, phoneme, graphing, mapping. So that might be a more useful type of activity if you're doing this with a, a group of kids. So this is an example of what a phoneme graphing map might look at. And um, let's say the teacher, um, the first word is sap, right? I can't see it because <laughs> I have something hiding it on my screen. Um, but I think the first word is sap. So the, um, it, it, is that it? Do it. Sip. Sip. Okay, so first word is sip. So the teacher, um, uh, let's say the teacher dictates that word and the children have to write it. So, because we're doing this as a group. So then the teacher says something like, okay, now let's change sap to sip. Just one letter, sap, or sip to sap, excuse me. So then the children write this word. Now let's do, now I'm going to try to trick you. This is the harder word. Do sap to snap, snap to slap, slap to flap. So notice it's not always the same position in the word, right? Sometimes you're changing the initial phoneme or the medial phoneme. And the last example here, flash, it's the final phoneme of the word. And um, notice SH gets written in one box because it's one phoneme. Now, this is just a brief illustration, but if I were using this with a group of children, um, in 10 minutes, you could do 30 words. If you're doing the, if you're doing it, you know, if you've got the right level and you get into a snappy pace, maybe in a group, maybe not that many because you might have some children who, you know, are having difficulty, but definitely one-to-one -one <clears throat> where you're just calibrating it to one child, um, you can do a lot of words. And that would be the goal, to try to get a snappy pace where you're doing lots of words. But you're not, for example, gonna do, you know, sap to saw, 
because that changes the sound, right? That's an A-W. It's not a short vowel sound. Um, or you're not going to do, you know, sip to sir because that's a vowel R. So that example choice is important. The words have to be carefully chosen to fit the pattern. In a structured literacy approach, teachers provide clear feedback to children's decoding errors that focuses their attention first on the printed word and application of decoding skills, not guessing based on partial letter cues and context. So that was, um, that was something I mentioned earlier in relation to MSV models and what's problematic about, you know, encouraging children to look at the picture in order to decode the word. Um, or another problem that I talked about this morning is um, ignoring decoding errors. So sometimes teachers learn in their training, and this is this kind of goes along with the MSV model, that um, so-called contextually appropriate errors such as this or that are not important because they don't greatly change meaning, and so you can just ignore those errors. But really, children should have to correct even errors like off for the. With um, only a very few exceptions, you want to have an expectation if they're placed at an appropriate, in an appropriate level and type of book, that they're going to read the words correctly, all but, you know, maybe if there's some very unusual name or something like that. But um, you don't want to ignore errors because you're trying to develop a disposition in children to look carefully at words. And then once they're doing that, they can build speed. Um, but if they're not looking carefully at words, they're not going to really have the accuracy they need to build speed in a way that's effective. So here would be, so what should, what should the teacher do? Well, here's an example of teacher feedback to decoding errors in structured literacy approaches that um, I found very helpful. So um, let's say a child is reading a decodable text like Marvin's Trip to Mars. I don't know how many of you might know this. This is from the Flyleaf Books to Remember series, which is a wonderful decodable series that um, I used to love using with my students. Um, there's not a lot of books in the series, especially early on. So for kids who were really low level decoders, I found that, you know, there weren't enough of the real simple books with just CVC words, but it's great for kids who are at the stage where they're learning to read, you know, short vowel words with digraphs and blends and magic E and that sort of thing. So the text on um, this particular book is uh, working on vowel R, as you can tell, Marvin and Mars. And the text says, hop up, Marvin. You can bring your rocket to bed, Mar Mom tells Marvin as she pulls back his quilt. When I am big, I will blast off in a rocket. I will visit the planets and stars, Marvin tells Mom as she tucks him in tight. So suppose you're reading this text with a child, and um, the child does well until they come to the word quilt, then they pause briefly, glance at the picture, and quickly say, blanky. Now, if you've worked with poor decoders, you've seen them do this a million times, right? They're plugging in a word that fits the picture, but really bears almost no resemblance to the word on the page, except for the final T. So um, what, would, what kind of feedback would a structured literacy teacher do? Well, it's helpful to wait a minute to see if a child will try to self-correct. Probably in this example, the child won't try to self-correct because the word does fit the context, but um, it's good when children recognize that they've made an error and they try to fix it. So even if they're, they're not successful on their own, it's good to, you know, praise that. So it's, it's good to kind of wait, you know, just a few seconds to see what the child will do. If the child keeps going, the teacher po points to the word. So pointing cues are better to start with than verbal feedback because um, really two reasons. You're, you're drawing the child's attention directly to the printed word, which is exactly what you want. And you don't have a lot of verbiage, which is potentially um, you know, distracting in terms of comprehension. 
So let's say the child looks more closely at the word, but then produces quit instead of quilt. So then the teacher points to the letter L. Let's say the child successfully decodes quill. The teacher then says something like, great job, now just reread that sentence. So you have the child reread the sentence to kind of establish fluency and comprehension. So to put this in more general terms, a more general type of sequence would be allow a little bit of wait time to see what the child will do. If a child does not self-correct an error, provide pointing cues. Um, if pointing cues don't work, you can follow up with verbal cues if necessary, like um, for the quilt example, you could give feedback like um, that word has an L in it or something like that. Telling the child the word should generally be a last resort. Again, unless you have a word that, you know, has um, a very unusual word that you know the child is not going to be able to decode. But if the child is properly placed, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be many words like that. After decoding, the child rereads the sentence for fluency and comprehension. And that should include checking to ensure the word makes sense. So we don't, we never want kids to read mindlessly without thinking about meaning, but the point is you want, if, de, if a decoding error has been made, you want the first um, emphasis to be on, let's look carefully at that word and try to decode it, um, rather than, you know, let's use the picture to figure out what the word would be. Um, for morphology, um, there's lots of useful activities. So morphology refers to meaningful word parts like roots, prefixes, and suffixes. Um, some teaching about morphology is important even in the earliest stages of reading and spelling. For example, at a first grade level, the teacher might be teaching children about suffixes, common suffixes like final S and ED, because otherwise children will want to spell dogs, like D-O-G-Z, because it does sound like a Z at the end, or jumped sounds like it ends in a T, and children need to be taught, um, yeah, that's what it sounds like, but when we're talking about more than one, a plural, we add an S, or sometimes it's an E-F, and um, if we're talking about something that happened in the past, it's always going to be an ED, not, not just um, a T or something like that. Morphology becomes especially important as children advance to longer words. So um, as they get into two-syllable and multisyllabic words, it's not just, you know, these um, basic suffixes that you need to teach, but um, morphology becomes much more involved in reading and, and spelling also in vocabulary. So um, a good way to approach morphology as children get beyond the earliest stages is start with free morphemes. Free morpheme means it's a word that can stand alone, like wood or health, and um, transparent examples. So wood, wooden, help, helpful, helper, helping. Transparent examples means um, don't use a word, uh, or this is, wouldn't be an ideal choice, would be um, begin is not an ideal choice because then we have begin, begun, began. It's not a regular past tense because we don't say begin, right? So um, it'd be better to avoid that as an initial example, not saying children don't have to learn it eventually, but as your initial ex set of examples, um, use more transparent words. Then later, you want to progress to bound morphemes. So bound means they can't stand alone, like rupt is not a word by itself. Um, so these are often root, uh, roots of Latin and Greek derivation. So a root like rupt is in words such as rupture, interrupt, corrupt, interruption. So children can learn not only how to read it and spelling, but spell it, but that it means to break. And that gives them clues as to the meanings of these other words. And what's most useful here, I think, is that, in my opinion, morphology, you know, it, it, it gives um, sort of a helpful hint as to the meaning of a word like interrupt. But if the child really had no experience with that word, they wouldn't necessarily 
be able to figure out its meaning. So it's most useful when children have had some exposure to these words and then the teacher can kind of highlight the, the shared root and how it relates, you know, interrupt is like breaking into a conversation, um, for instance. So you're going to be, again, emphasizing linkages to reading words, spelling words, and word meanings or vocabulary. So the word sort activity that I showed you for syllable types could also be used for uh, morphology. So let's say children have learned, or let's say the teacher wants to contrast, uh, you know, words that have the root help, work, or trust, then you have, um, it's the same idea as with the syllable types activity, you have labels or headings for groups, and then you have words like helper, helpful, helplessly, or worker, homework, trusted, and trust, and so on. And the cards are all mixed up, and the child has to put them in the right column or the right group. And just like with syllable types, I like having them in other categories because it makes the children look more carefully at the word. And, um, you know, if they put timeless in the trust column, you know, they haven't looked carefully at it, right? So, um, and then they go back in this activity, I would probably have them go back and read the individual words and then possibly talk a little bit about meaning, especially um, for words where they might not, you know, where they might not know it, where it's less obvious, like um, the, what does distrust mean or what does workable mean or something like that. But otherwise, it's kind of a similar word sort activity, but focused more on morphology rather than orthographic patterns, which is basically what the syllable types are. Um, here are a couple of other examples of morphological activities. So you can have children divide multisyllabic words based on morphology. Um, as shown, so they divide a word like incredible. It's not dividing it by syllables. Um, because otherwise incredible would have four syllables, right? But ibble is um, a, a morpheme that makes the word an adjective. And cred would be um, would be a root, but it's it's a bound morpheme. It's not a free morpheme because cred wouldn't stand alone. Um, or some in some phonics programs, they might refer to some of this as peeling off. Um, prefixes and suffixes. So you teach the child to peel off these parts and then look for what's left as the root. That's another kind of similar approach you could take. Children can also build as many words as possible from a given set of word parts. So you give them parts like the ones shown on, let's say, it could be on index cards or something like that. And they um, build words like, you know, photography, photographer, um, biographer, biography, and so on. Um, sentence combining, I alluded to earlier, that's a, a, a sentence level written expression activity. And authorities have made the point that, you know, sentence level reading and writing often doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's an important level. So this is an effective activity for teaching children how to write good sentences. <laughs> and the teacher starts by modeling practice examples with kernel sentences. So you have a set of kernel sentences and the children have to combine them into one good sentence. I'll show you an example in just a moment. Um, and it's important to remember with sentence combining that the ultimate goal is for children to apply it to editing their own pieces of writing. So it starts out with these kind of out of context activities with kernel sentences. But ultimately, what you want them to do is look at their own writing if they're writing a piece on, you know, let's say you have a fifth grader who's writing an essay on something, but all of the sentences are these really short little staccato sentences. You want them to, you know, be able to combine sentences so that they have more varied type of sentence writing. I do this all the time in my writing, but 
I do it the opposite way because I've been told by many people that I tend to write long, complex sentences. So I've now learned, like I edit my work for that myself. Sometimes I still need to edit it more um, for that uh, one thing, but um, I break up, I'll break apart long sentences so that I don't have too many long sentences in succession. Same basic principle. Um, sentence combining also gives children practice in wording sentences in different ways, which is very useful in writing. So here's an example. So children could be given kernel sentences like, Brian has a yellow dog. The dog is a Labrador retriever. The dog loves to play Frisbee. And then the task for the child is to put the sentences together in um, one good grammatically correct sentence. Um, and there is a variety of possible answers. So, um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but something of uh, one good answer could be Brian's dog, a yellow Labrador retriever, loves to play Frisbee, or Brian's yellow Labrador retriever loves to play Frisbee, or the yellow Labrador retriever who loves to play Frisbee is Brian's dog. Um, but it would not be acceptable to say, Brian has a yellow Labrador retriever because that doesn't put the three ideas together. You have to put the three ideas together. And it also would not be acceptable to say, Brian has a yellow dog and it is a Labrador retriever and it loves to play Frisbee because that's not really a great sentence in terms of structure, okay? Here's an example of the thing that I mentioned earlier about practice wording sentences in different ways. Um, this is a skill I use all the time as a writer, and I don't remember anybody ever teaching it me, to me directly, but it would be really helpful. So um, in scientific writing or academic writing, um, a lot of the time the writing has a word limit, like you have, and, it's, and it always feels, you know, too short for me, like it's not enough, but you have to get in the habit of saying things concisely. So. So I would reword to the second option, Brian's yellow Labrador retriever loves to play Frisbee if I were writing um, for publication in some journal that had you know, a length limit. On the other hand, um, the last one, to me it seems like that one has a little bit of a different emphasis. It's like you're emphasizing which dog is Brian's dog. The yellow Labrador retriever who loves to play Frisbee is Brian's dog. So if I wanted to emphasize that idea, maybe I would word it that way. Um, and there's a lot of that nuance in, you know, in writing. Or maybe I would pick the first sentence if I had a sentence right next to it that, you know, had a certain structure like uh, I want to have variety in my writing. So it kind of gives, it's, a, it's an avenue for talking to children about the idea that, you can have different ways of saying the same thing, and sometimes one way fits the context better than another way. This is probably not something you're going to be doing with children at very beginning levels of achievement, but certainly, you know, upper elementary, junior high, high school would be very appropriate to have those, uh, that kind of discussion. So, um, so I think we're ready for the practice. Uh, cases in the breakout groups at this point, Great. and there are two cases, um, one for Zachariah and one for Antonio, and the relevant handouts are, that you need, there's a Word document that's called Pat in Breakout Cases um, PM Session, and then there's also an additional PDF for Zachariah, which is the same one if you were in the morning session, it's the same one for him, but it's a different Word document for the afternoon. So there so, were, oh, I'm there sorry, were, go ahead. No, 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 there were a few questions that popped up in the chat and I just didn't know if you wanted to answer those. Uh, yeah, this is a good time, yep, absolutely. Okay, so the first one was, should we train parents in how to give, and it says automatic, but correction. Should we change parents in how to give corrections? Yes, I think um, actually that is a great question and I, it's something that's pretty easy to learn um, how to do. And I also think, I, I assume the questioner is asking about the feedback while children are reading aloud right. in books. 
Um, so yes, I think that could be very um, valuable and parents could learn how to do it. And the other group that can learn how to do it are paraprofessionals. So if you have a paraprofessional reading with a child, um, you know, they won't necessarily do it that way automatically. Like how would they know? And right. sometimes, um, sometimes they're not going to, sometimes um, people are uneasy about correcting every mistake because they don't want to discourage the child. But again, you're trying to develop a disposition to look carefully at the text. So it's important. And um, you and that can even, you know, the, a child-friendly explanation can be offered even to the child about that, about why it's really important to look carefully at the print. Perfect. And then Helen asked, if I have been reflecting on the reading A to Z example, if the book has sight words, students are learning, is it still possible to use these? The teacher could introduce words that are phonetically advanced for the students as story words, first orally and then in writing, uh, drawing attention to the sounds that are represented in the word by the letter sound the students are familiar with, is, or is it better to skip these word books since they are not decodable and encouraging guessing? Um, I would say the second one, okay? So I think um, generally better to skip those words. Now, Here's the, here's the caveat to that. I mean, of course, there are kids that, you know, they'll be just fine if you use the predictable books. They're not the kids that we tend to see if you work with struggling readers, but lots of kids, you could do it the, the first way, you know, teach sight vocabulary, sight words, and then um, you know, try to teach them how to decode the longer words or certain phonemes, but it's not really, um, it's not teaching systematically because usually words like eraser, you wouldn't be doing at the beginning of first grade, right? It makes more sense to do um, more in terms of phonics patterns, and I think that's an approach that works a lot better uh, for, for the weaker readers in the class. The, the stronger readers are more resilient a lot of the time, and so it won't matter as much for them, but you can still use decodable text and then let those, the children who are the stronger readers in a class, you know, move ahead to harder books, or if they're capable of independent reading, those are children that could do independent reading or project work. So I think it's helpful to have the, the books be coordinated to the needs of children who are weaker readers and then make the adaptations for the kids who are the stronger readers. Okay, and then um, another one was asking if you have a list of recommended resources for practical application. Um, I don't really, I'm not sure what the, you mean like recommended activities or pro, you know, there's certainly lots of, um, books out there that have really great activities, you know, anything by Louisa Motes, um, the um, uh, Marty Haugen's um, and Susan Smart's text, um, which is called Fundamentals of Literacy Assessment and Instruction is a great resource. The um, book I used to use, the textbook I used to use with my undergrads was the core teaching reading source book, which I love. Um, There's certainly lots of really good, you know, materials available, but I don't have a specific list. Yeah, and I would say uh, to just the participant as a patent consultant, always following Dr. Pam Kastner on um, her Facebook page, she'll accept you, and, and she she uploads tons if you're from, I mean, she uploads tons of resources, and so just kind of keep an eye on her. She's a very wonderful resource to have. So that's a state. great idea. Yeah, great idea. Um, and then the last one is the phoneme graphing mapping is terrific. Can it be used before or after a phoneme awareness, phonemic awareness lesson with colored squares to clarify for students the ideas of adding and deleting sounds? Yes, I think it absolutely could be used that way. And, um, you know, in a sense, when you're, when you're using it, you're sort of integrating the phoneme blending and phoneme segmentation directly. Um, and there are other adaptations that could be made. If, if you have a child where you think the color coding would be helpful or the, you know, uh, work specifically on phoneme skills before the child is reading words, you could definitely do it 
That way, another modification that I didn't um, mention, but if you have kids who really struggle with blending, it can often be helpful to start with continuous sounds before stop consonants. So continuous sounds are the ones you can hold, like as opposed to b, k, t, the ones like that. So continuous sounds are easier to blend. So starting with words like um, Sam would be easier than a word like tap, even though it's only three phonemes in each case because Sam has continuous sounds. All right, I think that's it. Okay, good, all right. So, um, so a little bit more about what you'll do in your breakout groups. So for each child, decide whether the child needs intervention in uh, as one, you know, think about that simple view of reading. Um, do they need uh, intervention in reading words like decoding or phonics? And do they need intervention in language comprehension? Intervention, not just instruction. Okay, so if you were in the AM session, this was already discussed for both of the children that you're going to be looking at. Based on the assessment data that's provided, decide the specific skills that should be addressed next in intervention. For example, if decoding and word reading intervention is needed, should the next step for this student be CBC words, vowel R words, two syllable, multi syllable, et cetera? And in making these judgments, um, for both children have either core phonics survey data or GE test data. So use 80% as your criterion for mastery for the children. If the child needs language comprehension intervention, try to decide the specific areas that need to be addressed within the domain of language comprehension. For example, vocabulary, syntax, um, background knowledge, things like that. Decide the appropriate type or grade level of text to use in intervention. So for example, does the child need to read a decodable that is a phonetically controlled text? If not, what grade level of text should the student be reading in intervention? Because we at least have to have a text that they're able to read accurately, right? And then plan and describe specific structured literacy intervention activities that would be appropriate for the child at their current level of reading and spelling. So these could be things like word building activities, um, spelling, morphology, sentence combining, oral reading of text, etc. And if it's feasible and you have time, maybe include some examples of specific words and practice items. So um, I'm going to put people, how many people do we have all together, Lisa? It looks like right now we lost a couple, but there are 31 participants. So there'll be 29 people with you and I without. Okay. Them. So I think I will do six groups of um, five in each group or, um, you know, possibly four for one group. And um, we'll have, let's see, it goes till 445. So we'll have um, probably 30 to 45 minutes for people to work on this. And I will come around to each group to answer any questions you might have. Feel free to work on the two cases in any order. And we will discuss both cases at the end of the session, but it's fine if you don't have time to complete both as you work in your groups. And then could you make me co-host? Because I'll reload those into the chat room. Uh, to yeah. the chat, just uh, so I will if you remind me how to do it. Okay. Yep, just in the participant. If you click on the participant on the bottom. Um, on the same bar as the breakout, you should see a participant. Oh, okay, wait a minute, let me. Do I have to stop sharing? Oh, yes, you do. Okay, let me do that. All right, and then, um, can I do the breakout rooms first? Sure. And then, okay, so let me just do those. So we'll, we'll do six with five to six participants per room. So we'll create rooms. And um, again, I'll come around to all the groups um, at least one time. 
And if you need to step away or you need something from me, that breakout room will open on the bottom of all participant windows so they can always get back to it. Okay, great, great. All right, and then let's see, was it, I'm trying to figure out where it was to do the, um, well, all these, so all these guys are going to drop out. And if you hover over my name, it'll say more. Oh, okay. There we go. Yep. And then just, yep. Make me a co-host. Yep. There we go. That should do awesome. it. Wonderful. So I can see everybody in the waiting room. Perfect. All right, so we've got somebody who came back in. So can you, you wanna put her in three? She got kicked out really fast. Yeah. Yep, yep, that sounds good. Do I need to click admit? I, I admitted her, so she's, okay. yeah. And I'm not sure who Sarah is. I don't think she's been here before. She's been in there for a while um, and I haven't gotten an email, so I'm just wondering if she's walked away, but right. um, these would be your last people. So Jennifer was the one that we just let back in. So if you wouldn't mind just putting, I think you can just assign her to three. So if you open your breakout room window, yeah, she'll be in there as unassigned. Do you see that? Um, I don't see her here. I see, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. I see people that are, you know, not joined, but I don't see anybody who's not assigned. Okay, great. Then we should be fine. Okay, great. All right. So I'm going to let them get started for, you know, at least five minutes or so. Sure. And I'm going to step away just for a couple of minutes and then I'll be back. And so I'm planning to, um, you know, maybe let them do this until about four, maybe about 420. Wonderful. Or so, and then we'll plan a good 20 minutes. That's perfect. For, for the discussion and um, maybe handle it the same way that we did last time. Okay. Where they, I went, is it too many people you think? Seems no. Like I, yeah, so we'll do it the same way we did last time. Sounds great. I think it'll keep right. them engaged, especially at the end of the day. So. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. I know. It's, hard. it's a long day. It's a long day, but <laughs> okay. it's an amazing day. It is so, yeah. I mean, and yeah. it's funny because yeah. my colleague texted, she said, how's it going? I said, there's so much new stuff. It's so great. <laughs> well, good. That's so, great. Thank All you. right, well, I'll see you in like five minutes. I'll be okay. back. Okay, wonderful. Yeah.
Say again, I'm sorry. Mute myself. There we go. Um, so things are going pretty well. Great. And uh, now I'm on into breakout room three. People seem okay. to be doing okay so far. I'll be back. Sounds perfect.
in my going around to the different groups, pretty much everybody, you know, had this part. So Zachariah is a student that really just in terms of intervention, he needs work on um, decoding and word reading skills. He doesn't need the language comprehension piece. Um, and uh, by word reading, I would include both phonics and phonemic awareness would be, you know, certainly an important need for him. And um, anybody you want to talk about what word types you would start with uh, based on, think about, you know, his scores, for example, on the core phonics survey. Uh, we were saying to go with the closed syllable, the CVC pattern. Yes. I would, and build from the strength. Yes. I would start with that because he's not really at mastery in that category. He's close. So hopefully it would be something that, you know, could be, you could progress quickly to the next two more difficult patterns. But I think CVC would be a, a, a starting point because he's not quite at mastery there. So that's, um, so that's good. That's good. And then um, how would you teach phonemic awareness? Anybody want to speak to that? And what kinds of phonemic awareness skills? Don't be shy. 
Certainly the um, blending and segmenting piece. Yes. The one Absolutely. question I have for you, I think you had said it's easier for kids who struggle with blending to start with continuous sounds, right? Is Correct. That yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that would be some, that's some actually an excellent point. Um, that seems like something that maybe would be useful for Zachariah, you know, starting with those sounds initially, something like it's, it's especially the first sound, um, it's not as much the last sound in the word. So for example, with sap, the child doesn't have to blend anything after the, but the first sound is really important. And um, all the vowels are pretty much continuous sounds, right? You can hold them like ah, e, ah. So um, starting with words like sap and lap and map and Sam and fan, um, rather than, you know, tap and bag and words like that. Yes. So um, it just kind of dawned on me too. Um, I know some teachers will start at the vowel and do the rhyme piece mm -hmm. and then add the onset. Would, would that be something to do with um, them? That could be something you could try and see if it, it helps. And um, I've also I've also seen people do something similar where only they do um, it's not based on onset rhyme but it would be so like for a word like bag if you would have the child blend the first two parts ba and then add the g at the end so something like that so yes I think um, absolutely if it, if some of the things um, especially if some of the things that have already been discussed aren't helping trying other ways to do it could also be helpful. Uh, one of the things that came up in one of the groups also was articulatory cues. So the articulatory, and um, there's programs like Linda Mood that teach you know, pretty elaborate articulatory cues. But I, I didn't think when I was talking to that group to also mention that you can use articulatory cues in a more informal kind of way. So you don't have to teach the, you know, 10 bazillion kind of sounds. You could do just in spelling, ask the child, for example, to watch your mouth, okay, as you're saying the word. Um, or you could um, encourage the child to say the word quietly to himself and drag out the sound and think about, you know, how his mouth feels as he's saying those sounds. So that that's something you could really do with any student without having all of the, you know, effort, time effort that goes into um, a program like Linda Mood involving teaching of articulatory cues. And that can sometimes be very helpful, uh, especially for spelling. Can I ask you about that, a question about that? So if, if which is the, the preferable way to teach that if you're teaching if you're just teaching with the vowel first and then bringing in the initial sound or doing it the, the reverse way like in with bag and you said you teach you know bah and then add the end does that preserve the left to right directionality better um you know i don't know of research that specifically addresses that point. So I think it's in the domain of, you know, it's good to try some of the research-based things first. So the articulatory cues and the continuous sounds before stop consonants, that has some research base. I think these other things are reasonable things to try, um, but they're more things you try out of your, you know, experience as a teacher and so I don't, I wouldn't have a strong preference, really. I okay. would just try them out with the individual student and see what works. Okay. We have, we've had a lot of controversy about that. Oh, so. okay. okay. <laughs> definitely don't do the, you know, look at the picture and guess what works. Right, that. right. <laughs> don't do that. But these different strategies where you're having the child look carefully at the word and try to, you know, decode it those different ways all seem reasonable to me and I'm not aware of a, of the two things that we were talking about of a re research that speaks to one being better than the other necessarily. Thank you. Sure, sure. So um, what type of text should Zachariah read in intervention? Should he read a decodable or does he not really need a decodable? 
He would definitely need decodable text. If he's he not accurate with CBC, he's got to yeah. have it. <laughs> he needs a decodable big time. Yeah, he's like a really good example of the type of student that, you know, use of decodable text is really important. He, it really appears that he, any kind of uncontrolled text, I think that passage you read in the ILI, he had like, I don't know, 50% word accuracy. So he really needs a decodable. And um, something like the Red Fox Cub might be a good, you know, initial one to try because it's primarily CBC words. Um, I always find with picking texts for kids that you use things like informal reading inventories to give to make an educated guess. You know, you look at the data on their decoding skills and their performance on reading inventories, and you make an educated guess. But then it's always a little bit of a trial and error process. Sometimes the thing you think, and, and the right book is pretty important, like having the right book. You ideally, you want it to be a book at the right level of difficulty and also something that hopefully is of some interest or the child gets some sense of accomplishment from reading it. So the book is kind of important. So I, you know, I would always encourage my students to try out different books. And um, if the first one, you know, it's like, oh, let's say, I don't think we have any men, so I can say this, hopefully not offend anybody. A friend of mine used to say, you know, so many men, so little time. I think books are like that. So many books, so many, so little time. If, if, you know, the first book is not right. Um, try, keep trying, try to find something different that will be a better fit, uh, either whether it's because of skills or interest level. It is very challenging with the very low level readers um, to find, you know, books that are intrinsically interesting. But I think with a child Zachariah's age, an advantage of the early intervention is you have children that are not too turned off yet. And they're not too focused on how they're going to look to other kids the way you would see more with an older student. So um, the kids that we had, my field work program was oriented toward grades one and two struggling decoders. It was specifically for those kind of kids. And um, most we had kids who would say, you know, they would be reading like the Bob books. I don't know if anybody, those are ultra controlled, you know, very like CBC with A, books like that. And we would have kids say things like, this is the first book I ever read. Can I bring it home? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's an advantage yeah. to starting to the early intervention piece. Um, okay, let's see. What are some specific structured literacy activities that could be beneficial to Zachariah? Um, I would definitely think the um, letter building with the word tiles. Yeah, that's least. perfect for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once the kids, you know, once the kids get into more complex words, I found the word building not quite as helpful, um, but it's really perfect for the kids that are at a stage where they're reading like short vowel words. And probably what I would do with a student like Zachariah is I would start with CBC. You can almost use it, it can become almost like an assessment task. So you, with a kid like Zachariah, I would start with CBC. I would see how he's doing. I would be substituting different sounds like initial sound, final sound, vowel sound. If he did well with that, I would, um, I would kind of try to stretch it toward like short vowel words with consonant digraphs. Because the, um, mm -hmm. the, the assessment material said that he did know some digraphs. So I'd only plug in digraphs that he knew. And then maybe try bl uh, plugging in some blends. And you kind of push to the point where the student starts to have more difficulty, even with scaffolding. And then you drop back a little bit. And it kind of allows you to see what are their current limits. Um, but you, the, my problem with a lot of what I see on the web with word building is it's really slow. It's OK, let, let's do this word slow motion let's do this next word you really want it to be like okay try this one try, oh i'm gonna trick you now i bet you can't get this one. Oh, you got it okay let's try this one you won't get this one and a lot of kids will respond really well 
to that. If you're careful about your word choice and you can do lots of words, it gives them lots of practice and it really builds confidence. The thing that the hardest part we used to have is we'd stop up the whole tutoring block. So I would have to say to the student, no, you have to stop the word building and now you have to move on to something else because otherwise they would, you know, spend the whole time doing that. It was very successful for, for many, not all, but for many kids. Um, so what else besides word building? Word building is a really good choice for him. Anybody think of some other things that would be good for him? The appropriate spelling activities. Uh, yes, yeah, so he could do word building. What could also be done in a way to help him with spelling. Writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another thing I would think about is um, in, in the part of the talk that was about, you know, those multi-sensory whole word tracing techniques for irregular words, mm -hmm. that could be really beneficial yes. for Zachariah because he needs work on irregular words. And it's one of those activities where you kind of get um, a twofer. You get a benefit for both reading and spelling the word. So um, it can be, you know, that can also be very helpful. And of course, you know, oral reading with a teacher um, in the decodable with appropriate scaffolding and the um, integration of phonemic awareness activities with decoding would all be things that would be really important for him. So I'm going to skip to um, Antonio now because I want to have a little bit of time to talk about Antonio and we're kind of getting short on time. So this is the example of a student with a mixed reading problem. He needs work on both decoding and certain aspects of language comprehension. So with regard to decoding, when you're thinking about the GE test results, what kind of words would you want to start with with him? Um, I definitely think teaching him syllable types is very important because he's not getting the, the ending blends on words and he's very inaccurate. So I'm not sure if there's an assessment that you could do to find out what syllable types he knows, but I think that's definitely a place to start. So can you give me an example of like what you're thinking of in terms of like give me an example of an error he's making that you think syllable types would be helpful for? Um, when we were looking at his core phonics data, he was his data supported that he knew CBC words, long vowel, final E, he knew his R controlled vowels, but when he got to endings like with the LE, like maple, ah, okay. it went down dramatically. Yes. Okay. So here's the problem with when he's reading maple for maple. Here's what I think is going on, but it would bear, you know, um, I, I could be wrong, but here's my hunch. He's not, he's not parsing the word the right way. He's not dividing it properly. So what he really needs to learn is you always keep the consonant and LE pattern together. And I think, you know, you could be right that it could be helpful to teach him something about syllable types in this context. But I, the one reason I'm hedging about the syllable types is he can read one syllable words pretty well. So I wouldn't want to do anything that involved, you know, really long labor teaching of something that's not going to apply directly to two syllable words. So I would, it, and two syllables is kind of where he needs to start based on those GE test results. So maybe teach, um, you know, when a word has a consonant LE at the end, which is the kind of, you have to learn that syllable type, right? Divide immediately before the consonant LE, and then the first syllable, if it's just one vowel at the end, it's going to have a long vowel. And it might be helpful to teach open and closed, you know, in that context. But I would try to do it kind of fast, kind of efficiently, because, um, you don't want it, again, his ability to read single syllable words is pretty good. So you don't want to, you know, belabor skills that um, are not really the skills he needs because we want to kind of move him along. And um, I think that's the big issue with the consonant LE words. He's not dividing it. He's not dividing the words in the right place. He's dividing map O, he's dividing between the P and the L instead of recognizing that you keep the consonant and leave together at the yeah. end. 
Um, let's see, what else anybody think of, um, you know, definitely you, so you could take that approach, teaching consonant and LE words. And there's one other, um, you could do approach it a little bit differently in terms of different word types. So the other thing he had trouble with was reading words with common suffixes, right? Yeah. So that would be another approach you could take, teach some common suffixes, and then have him plug those into words, two oh, syllable oh, words to start with. That now, would be that would be another um, approach that would be reasonable for him. What about going into some morphology because then it would also build his vocabulary along. Yeah, way. that is a great idea. Mm -hmm. He's the type of student because he has need, he has broad needs in vocabulary, spelling, and decoding, and his decoding is not real low. So he's ready to learn. You know. Um, root words and suffixes and things like that. So um, absolutely, he is a student that um, teaching of morphology, mm -hmm. like common roots, prefixes, suffixes, and then tying in, you know, meaning. So as he learns a root word like astro, he learns how to spell it and that it means star, and he can use it to figure out related, semantically related types of words. So yeah, that would be very, very appropriate for him. Um, how about in the, so we, so morphology partly addresses vocabulary. Um, how about mm -hmm. other aspects of language comprehension? What else does he need work on in terms of language comprehension? And this is more, I think, in the description. There's not a test for it. So maybe think about an area like background knowledge. Um, that's something that seemed to be, you know, a weakness for him. And background knowledge, of course, covers lots of territory. So you would want to think about background knowledge, especially in relation to the specific text that he has yeah. to read. You know, what does he need for this particular text? If it's a book about, um, you know, I don't know, uh, going uh, going mountain climbing, you know, what do you need to know about mountain climbing that he might not know that he needs in order to have a basic comprehension, basic yeah. comprehension of the story, <clears throat> that sort of thing. And uh, morphology is great for vocabulary, but also just directly teaching word meanings, that would be important, you know, so uh, the words that he needs to understand a particular text. How about in terms of a book? Does um, Antonio need a phonetically controlled type of book? Um, I would think not based on the data with his phonics patterns. Um, right. Something I think he does need is since he's drowning in middle right. school with the text is maybe some instruction on how to read nonfiction text more efficiently. Um, Absolutely. So I think that would be really beneficial to him. Um, and he, he need, it needs to be a text at his instructional level, which looks to be about grade four. So it could be curriculum materials, but they'd have to be probably, you know, at his grade level right now is going to probably be too hard. So it needs to be things written at a lower grade level. It could also include grade four, you know, trade books things like that. And again, you could try different materials. Kids will vary depending on whether they have, you know, background knowledge and an interest for a particular subject. That can make a difference too. So I would try out different materials and see, you know, how he does and what looks at, uh, like a good fit. But for Antonio, you know, given his age and the fact that he has issues in comprehension, you probably want to aim for pretty high accuracy. So look for books he can read with 95, 96% accuracy or better, even for instruction. Because if he's dealing with comprehension issues too, apart from decoding, you don't want him to have to struggle too much with the decoding demands of the text. Um, we're almost, we're, we got like three more minutes. So um, why don't we use the little bit of time that's left? Anybody have questions that they want to ask? 
there was one question added to the chat. Okay. Um, we talked about the Reading League's decodable book list resource, but I would love to know more. Um, oh, you mean, um, so what are some good decodable series? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a question. So, um, yes, I, I didn't know that the Reading League had a, um, a list of decodables, but I think that's a great idea. I'll have to check that out. Um, you know, the one I know of, it's really, um, I don't know, it's, it's very random. It's so I love the flyleaf books. Um, but there's not quite enough of them to use it as your total, you know, curriculum. I've used the right skills series. I've used the A to Z decodables. Oh, what's that that Lori's got? Um, it's the alphabet series from EPS. That's the one I really Oh, like. oh I love EPS. So EPS has great stuff. So um, there's also a series that I've used with our fieldwork kids that's a British series. Um, I forget what it is, but it's older children and it's, you know, a little bit more palatable for kids if you have really poor decoders that are more like middle to upper elementary can be a little more palatable. There, uh, the only issue is they have some, you know, it's British English, so sometimes they'll say like chips when they mean when we would say French fries, like things like that. But um, but it's a it's a good series. Um, you can probably try. I wish I could remember the name off the top of my head. Um, there's some really good ones out there. Um, but it's worth you know exploring and um, seeing what they've got. And EPS has a lot of great materials for phonics teaching. When um, you know I mentioned before the thing about productive seat work activities that you don't have to rely on the word shapes kind of thing. I was thinking of EPS um, because there's great activities that you could give kids to practice phonics and spelling and things like that. Um, that would be much more productive for them than the clues kind of thing. Um, I think our time's up. It is. I'm just Thanks. typing in. Jamie shared the link to that. So I'm just oh, great. Thank you, Jamie. Put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and, but definitely go there and take a look. There's lots of things right now with COVID that are less expensive or yeah. sample sets or things that are for free right now that you can go up and grab. We have two things to read to you. Um, the First one, if you can stick around, uh, we wanted to, of course, thank you, Dr. Spear Swirling, My for pleasure. spending the afternoon with us. I mean, amazing. The feedback in the chat has been, thank you so much. This was so useful. My I pleasure. can't wait to turn around with my colleagues. So there have been so many, so many people who are grateful for your expertise today. Um, and thank you to all of you who attended the session. We were glad you stuck with it for that two hours and 45 minutes. It seems like a long time, but I know it went pretty fast. I always reread as the as you're going through as well. This session was recorded and will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the near future. The Patent Literacy team is also creating supports. Uh, we'll have a PLC aligned to the presentations at the Symposium to Maximize Learning for Families and Educators. 